A Nobel Prize winning physicist breaks down in tears, not from joy, but shock. China's Chang'e 6 has returned with something far more than moon dust. Hidden in the far side's ancient soil are materials that could fuel cities, reshape space law, and tilt global power. This isn't science fiction, it's happening now. First ever far side moon samples. In a move that may redefine the limits of robotic exploration, China's Chang'e 6 mission touched down in a place no probe had ever dared to sample before, just the far side of the moon deep within the mysterious South Pole Aitken Basin. This massive impact site over 2,500 kilometers across is one of the oldest scars on the lunar surface, possibly dating back over 4 billion years. For scientists, it has long been the dream destination, a geological vault holding untouched material that predates much of the known solar system. Over a 53-day mission, Chang'e 6 did what was once thought impossible. Using advanced autonomous drills and scoops, the lander extracted nearly 1.94 kilograms of lunar material, including subsurface layers from up to two meters deep. These samples were then sealed, launched back into orbit, and sent on a return course to Earth, entirely robotically without a human hand involved. This is unprecedented, said Dr. Liang Wei, one of the lead scientists reviewing the material as it arrived in Beijing. We're holding part of the moon that sunlight has never touched. The emotional moment wasn't just about science, it was about crossing a threshold. Until now, all return lunar samples came from the near side, the face always turned toward Earth. But the far side, cold, quiet, and shielded from our view, had never given up its secrets. Until now, geologists across the globe are preparing to study this lunar soil in detail. They're hoping to uncover differences in mineral makeup, isotopic content, and even signs of mantle material. Rock from deep inside the moon, thrown up by ancient impacts. Some early observations already suggest the regolith is denser and chemically distinct from nearside soil. That could hint at differences in how the moon evolved, or even point to previously unknown events in its history. This is not just a mission, it's a pivot point. The far side of the moon is no longer a mystery, and for the first time, humanity has brought a piece of it home, a mineral beyond forecast. Less than two weeks after the Chang'e 6 samples arrived on Earth, analysts working around the clock made a stunning discovery, a completely new lunar mineral, one never before seen by human eyes. Named Change Site, the crystal was found in a microscopic fragment of lunar rock, but what it contained made global headlines. Traces of helium-3, the ultra-rare isotope considered one of the most promising fuels for future nuclear fusion. This could be a game-changer, said Dr. Yulia Ren, a physicist at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, her voice trembling as she reviewed the spectrometry data. Helium-3 is incredibly scarce on Earth, but on the Moon, especially in the sunlit regolith, it has been theorized to exist in greater abundance. Until now, though, evidence was thin. The discovery of helium-3 embedded in change site, Y, confirms that it isn't just theory anymore. Helium-3 fusion produces little to no radioactive waste, making it a potential holy grail of clean energy. If future technologies can unlock it, even a small quantity could power entire cities. What's shocking is where this mineral was found, not in the sun-exposed near side, but in the cold, shadowed soil of the moon's far side, long thought to be less promising for such materials. That flips old models on their head. China is now only the third nation in history to discover a brand new lunar mineral, joining the United States and the former Soviet Union. But more than prestige, this finds signals strategic advantage. The moon may hold millions of tons of helium-3, and China's success in returning material from such a remote location suggests it's already charting where to mine next. The implications are vast, energy independence, geopolitical influence, and a new phase in space resource competition. This mineral, though tiny, might be the spark that lights a new era. And as one official put it, holding the fragment between tweezers in a lab flooded with camera flashes, we may be looking at the most valuable rock in the solar system, water ice and hidden compounds. As the Chang'e 6 samples were unpacked, the surprises kept coming. Among the familiar gray lunar dust were signs of something far more precious, water ice. 
Long suspected to exist in the South Pole's cold trap zones, these icy deposits are hidden beneath the surface, shielded from sunlight for billions of years. Now for the first time radar echoes from. The mission, paired with earlier data from China's fast telescope, suggests as much as 6% ice content within the top 10 meters of soil in specific shadowed regions. But water wasn't the only anomaly. Scientists identified unusual silicates and rare metallic oxides not typically found in earlier Apollo or Luna mission samples. These materials, while still under study, could hold immense industrial potential, from radiation shielding to advanced electronics manufacturing. This isn't just science fiction anymore, remarked Professor Lin Zhao, one of the materials specialists leading the early analysis. These compounds could change how we build in space. Water ice has practical uses far beyond curiosity. It can be split into hydrogen and oxygen, the building blocks for rocket fuel and life support systems. If these deposits are as widespread as current models suggest, they could one day support permanent lunar habitats, fuel stations, and even deep space missions launched from the moon's lower gravity well. And for China, being the first to confirm and extract these resources marks a massive strategic edge. These aren't just rocks. They're the beginnings of a lunar economy. Noble shock, scientific gravitas. When the raw data from the Chang'e 6 mission was first shared among the global scientific community, something unexpected happened. One of the world's most respected physicists, a Nobel laureate in space science, broke down in tears during a private briefing. The reason? The overwhelming realization of what this moment represented. This, this changes everything, he reportedly whispered unable to finish his sentence. What moved him wasn't just the geological insight or the technological brilliance behind the mission. It was the broader truth that the balance of power in space exploration had shifted and that we had just stepped into a new age of discovery and competition. The Chang'e 6 samples with their ancient isotopes, helium-3 crystals, and mantle layer signatures offered insights that could recast not just lunar history but the early evolution of the entire solar system. For a scientific mind trained to think in epics and billion-year scales, that impact is hard to quantify. But the emotional reaction wasn't just scientific, it was symbolic. This was the moment where science and geopolitics fused. A probe from one side of the planet had reached a place no one had touched and brought back matter that could reshape energy policy, space law, and planetary science for decades. The Nobel laureate's tears, later quoted in interviews and shown in media clips, became a touchstone moment, proof that we are not just looking up at the moon anymore. We are touching it, and it is changing us in return. Lunar Resource Race ignites. The discovery of helium-3 confirmed water ice and strange new minerals has done more than excite scientists. It has alarmed global space agencies. In the weeks following the Chang'e 6 return, Whispers of urgency turned into action. The United States, Europe, and even India accelerated their timelines for lunar exploration. Artemis missions, once sluggish, were suddenly being restructured. Why the rush? Because helium-3 could be the energy source of the future. A few tons of it, if fusion technology matures, could power entire nations without waste or carbon emissions. Water ice means sustainable fuel and life support, and if China has already mapped rich resource volumes, others risk being left behind. Whoever controls lunar resources, said one analyst at ESA, could control energy, orbit infrastructure, and access to the stars. The Outer Space Treaty of 1967 doesn't explicitly forbid harvesting resources, but it also doesn't regulate ownership clearly. This legal gray zone makes the current moment not just scientific, but strategically volatile. With no global framework in place, the moon may become the site of the first true extraterrestrial resource race. China, with its AI-driven landers and orbit-capable return systems, appears to have an early lead. But the response has begun. The question now isn't if nations will follow, but how fast they can catch up. China's technology leap. Behind the raw materials and scientific breakthroughs of Chang'e 6 lies an even bigger story. China's mastery of autonomous space systems. This was not just a robotic mission. It was a signal of what comes next. 
Chang'e 6 used AI-driven drilling and real-time navigation algorithms to land safely on one of the most unpredictable surfaces in the solar system. Operating on the moon's far side meant no direct communication with Earth. Instead, the lander relied on Kuekiao 2, a dedicated relay satellite hovering beyond the moon, to guide its descent and return sequence. Once samples were collected, the return capsule executed a complex lunar orbit rendezvous, linking with a module in lunar orbit before making its journey back to Earth. All of it was done without a single astronaut involved. It was like watching a machine think, said a Chinese mission engineer. Every movement was calculated. Every correction was autonomous. This kind of scalable automation is what gives China an edge. While NASA's Artemis program is still focused on human-led landings, China is building a framework for industrial, robotic lunar infrastructure. Machines that can mine, refine, and build without rest, without delay, and without life support. Chang'e 6 wasn't just a one-off, it was a template for future missions that could build fuel depots, launch solar power stations, or assemble robotic construction hubs. In the silence of the moon, China is teaching its machines to thrive. And with every successful operation, the gap between nations widens, not by luck, but by precision. Geological revelations. For decades, scientists believed the moon's far side might hold clues to the deep past of the solar system. The South Pole Aitken Basin, where Chang'e 6 landed, is not only the largest lunar impact crater, it's also one of the oldest planetary scars in our neighborhood. With this mission, that theory is finally being tested. The samples returned from up to two meters below the surface contain minerals and isotopes never seen in Apollo-era missions. Early analysis suggests the presence of mantle-derived rock, potentially excavated by the force of ancient impacts. These rocks might be our closest look yet at the moon's interior. Even more intriguing, some grains carry traces of ancient solar wind particles, offering a kind of time capsule from the early sun. We are reading pages from the first billion years of the solar system, said Dr. Eli Navarro, a planetary geochemist consulting on the international analysis team. There are also unexpected optical features, crystals and silicates that don't behave like anything found on the near side. Their structure may point to unknown lunar processes or even micro events of localized melting in the moon's ancient past. This isn't just academic interest. Understanding lunar geology helps us model planetary formation, estimate asteroid impacts, and assess where valuable materials like thorium, titanium, and helium-3 might be hiding. With these findings, the moon is becoming less of a gray, lifeless rock and more of a vibrant geological body with a complex living past. And each rock tells a story Earth never could. Geopolitics enters orbit. As the scientific data from Chang'e 6 pours in, governments around the world are paying close attention, not to the rocks, but to what they mean. Lunar exploration is no longer just science, it's soft power. With this mission, China hasn't just won prestige, it has potentially secured access to resources that could drive clean energy, orbital infrastructure, and even interplanetary travel. As one strategist at a Western Aerospace think tank put it, this is space diplomacy. Whoever leads the moon leads what comes after. In response, alliances are shifting. India, Japan, and the European Space Agency are discussing new cooperative missions, some of them focused directly on lunar mining or polar exploration. Private firms in the US and Europe are lobbying for resource rights, hoping to secure their stake before the legal framework is locked in. The lack of updated space resource law is creating tension. The Outer Space Treaty forbids national ownership, but it says nothing about private extraction. This legal gray zone has opened the door to a new kind of contest, one not fought with armies, but with landers, satellites, and patents. And beneath it all is a race to define the rules. Will space remain a shared domain, or will it be sliced into exclusive economic zones, just like Earth's oceans and airspace? The moon is no longer just a symbol of wonder. It's becoming a stage for strategy, where the players move faster, the stakes rise higher, and the consequences reach farther than ever before. Moon as economy, not monument. For over half a century, the moon has stood as a quiet monument to human exploration. But now it is being reimagined as a functional economy 
a new sphere of production, supply chains, and value creation beyond Earth. China's strategy is clear. It is mapping the moon not for flags, but for function. Their plans hint at a future where lunar materials, like helium-3, metallic oxides, and rare earth elements, are extracted and processed on-site, with robotic systems doing the heavy lifting. Already, engineers are studying how lunar regolith could be turned into radiation shielding, or how crystals could be grown in the vacuum-rich microgravity environment, too. Produce flawless semiconductors and high-precision optics. These aren't dreams. They are prototypes in progress. The moon offers manufacturing conditions we just can't match on Earth, noted a materials engineer from Tsinghua University. Water ice adds another layer. If harnessed effectively, it could support closed-loop habitats, providing drinking water, oxygen, and fuel for spacecraft. The long-term goal? A lunar logistics hub, a waypoint between Earth and Mars, where missions can refuel, recharge, and even rebuild. China's moves show a shift in mindset. This isn't just exploration. It's infrastructure building. It's the moon as utility, not mystery. And once that switch is flipped, everything changes from budgets to international law to who gets to define what space is for. A new era begins. In the quiet return of a robotic capsule in June 2 SC25, the world may have entered a new age, one defined not by what we discover, but by who controls the discoveries. Chang'e 6 didn't just bring home rocks, it brought home geopolitical leverage, energy potential, and a renewed vision of space's territory. The emotional testimony of a Nobel laureate, the rapid shifts in global space policy, the race to rewrite lunar law, these are not separate threads. They are signals that the moon is no longer a trophy. It is a battleground of ideas, industry, and influence. This was the moment everything changed, said a UN space law advisor after reviewing the mission brief. The moon became a mirror of Earth's future. What happens next will depend on what the world does with this moment. Will lunar space be shared, its riches distributed under collective stewardship? Or will it fall to the few who got there first, who dug deep, and who automated faster? The moon has always lit our skies. Now it lights a path to a future Sure, where science, sovereignty, and survival may orbit closer than we ever imagined. The moon is no longer a dead rock. It's the axis of a new space age. What began as science now echoes through politics, energy, and survival itself. China leads, the world scrambles, and one scientist's tears remind us, the future isn't just arriving. It's landing, drilling, and coming back with payloads.